Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love. And we are getting ready to deal with the dirty D's. All right. The dirty D's in life can really hinder us. God has so much in store for us. He has so much in our destiny that lies ahead of us. Even if it seems like everything we do is small, which is the way I feel most of the time. But the bottom line is there are riches and mysteries and benefits and blessings walking with the Lord and obeying Him, staying connected with Him and His Word and His people. Now, when we stay focused, as the Bible refers to it, we are running a race. We're fighting the good fight of faith. And we're doing it in these last days, which makes our choice is that much more crucial. So we have to be mindful of the fact that God is watching ever more carefully. He's always faithful to watch. But we have to be that much more faithful in everything we do. And the reason for that is if a siren, let's say, is going off, and someone is trying to tell you to get out of the bed, run out of the house, your house is on fire. You may not hear that person because somebody's playing with a siren down the street. Or one of your kids might be blasting the music so loud that all of you end up dying in a fire because you never heard anybody say, run out of the house, the stove is on fire, the gas is about to explode, and boom, it's all over. So God is trying to get us prepared like he did Noah in the last day, in his time. When God was going to destroy the earth with a flood and destroy everything in it. Can you imagine out of a whole globe of people, a population of different nations, only eight people made it? Think about that. Only eight. Not 800,000. Not 8,000 out of 800,000. Not, eight, not 80 out of 8,000 or 800,000. Eight. Think of how small that number is. And in these last days, God refers to us as the remnant. That's the reason. Some things always come small. Sometimes I get very tired of doing everything small scale because I'm a big scale kind of person. So it feels frustrating to me to have to do everything small scale. I don't know why it's like that, but it is. So I have to operate within my limits for now. I would love to have a big magnanimous conference where thousands of people come and we do some major ministry and everybody in our church group has hands-on opportunity to minister to all these people. But for some reason, God keeps me small scale. Now, thinking about that, in, this, in these last days, think about this, you guys. In these last days, God is hand picking people. He is honing us. He is shaping us. He's chipping away at our flesh. He is doing inner healing and deliverance. He's doing a deep work in us because we are in a crucial time. And God has to use us quickly because there are only going to be a chosen few that make it when he comes. I'm serious. We think it's going to be hundreds of thousands of people. In the days of Noah, there were only eight. And all these millions and millions and millions of people all over the globe, wouldn't it be pitiful if, if it was only 80 out of all those millions? So we have to be very careful how we make our choices, what we do, what we say, what we don't do, what we don't say. The Bible says... He that knoweth to do good and does it not to him, even that is sin. So we have to be very mindful, very 
focused. We have to be honed and channeled in to the things that God wants us to do, to the things God wants us to become. Now, this is what I want you to see. Satan is always running interference. And we know with him running interference the way he does, that there are going to be times where we're going to get frustrated and we're going to sit down in the middle of the road, part our legs, fold our arms, stick out our bottom lip, and why, 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 and wallow in our own self-pity. Because life can kick us in the teeth. Life can break our hearts. Life can bruise our egos. Life can make us want to give up on everything and everybody, even on ourselves. But God says, do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. And if life is hard on you right now, it does not mean that God is angry with you. It does not mean that God's judgment is on you. Judgment must begin at the house of God first. And in these last days, there's going to be a lot of judgment going on. But we will be delivered and safe because God will have already been dealing with us. So we have to have an ear to hear a mind to understand, a heart to receive, and a will to obey and line up with what God shows us. We also have to be honest with ourselves so that we can line up. Because if we're not honest, we'll never line up. So, this is what I want to share with you. These are the of the dirty deeds, and we're not going to cover them all today. We would be here for 10 hours if I try to cover all of these in one day. I may do a series on this, but I'm going to read the list, and then as God leads, we're going to go into certain words that we deal with in life. And hopefully God will help me continue this series even on Tuesday and next Saturday. We'll see what God says. And then we're going to read scripture. So I want you to hear the dirty deeds for you to be very, uh, to beware of. Let's say it like that. Beware of the dirty deeds in life. And that is delays, detours, distractions, deviations, disruptions, deprivations, disturbances, digressions, debasement, double-mindedness, depravity. Mm, mm, mm. Now, I'm going to stop there for now. What I want to share with you is digression. You know the old expression when people talk about one thing and then they get off on a tangent and they say, oh, I digress. Let me get back on the subject. Well, oftentimes in life, we digress. We get drawn away. Our attention gets sidetracked. And we lose our focus. We forget where we're headed. We forget who we are. We forget what God's cause is in our lives. And we start to get sidetracked. And have you ever driven down the street? Here's a Perfect example of losing your focus. Have you ever driven down the street and something catches your eye in the rear view mirror? And you're looking in the rear view mirror. I mean, you are focused, baby. And you're so focused on what's going on back there that you can't see what's going on right in front of you. And as God would have it, he will make you look forward and you'll catch yourself just in time not to crash and rear end the car in front of you. That's what happens when you focus away from where you're headed. We get distracted. We deviate from the, from the, the purpose at hand. 
And listen, that is why God talks in Proverbs about putting frontlets on your eyes. Because in a race, in a horse race, you notice they have those leather flaps on the side of a horse's uh, head. On the right and on the left side. Right next to their eyes. Why do they have that? They don't want the horses to get spooked, distracted, or deviate from the path by steering to the right or steering to the left. Because that's how races get lost. You want to win the race. You have to keep your eye focused on the finish line. You have to stay focused on what's, in head of, what's ahead of you. You cannot allow anything. You cannot allow your job. You cannot allow your money. You cannot allow drama in the family. You cannot allow issues between you and your neighbor. You cannot allow your ego or your pride. Whatever it is, you cannot allow anything to make you deviate from the path that you're on. See, we have to pray like never before. Because there will come times where people will come in our lives, where situations will happen, and they are not heaven sent. They are hell bent on keeping us from making our goal. So we have to be very, very careful and very prayerful. We even have to watch ourselves. Because we can be the main culprit. We can be the ones that are so focused on me, myself, and I, and all of my needs, and all of my issues, and all of my hurts, and looking in the rearview mirror, what they did to me, what they said to me, how they victimized me, how I was done wrong, how I will never forget that, and I will never forget that, and I'll never forget that. And you got them all numbered, and I, I, I mean, you've got an itinerary of offenses. And everything that's wrong with you is because of everything that's behind you. Well, guess what? God says in His Word, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, which means are becoming progressive, are becoming new. Your work in progress. So remember to stay on the path, on the beat and path. Stay under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. We are in the last days and there are things coming. And we have to have an ear to God's bosom. We have to have a heart to receive his signals. If we have too much static, too much fussing and fighting, too much distraction going on around us, we will miss God's voice. We will miss God's warnings. We will miss God's timing. And whoops, there it is. I said, whoops, there it is. You have to be careful in these days. Very careful. Now, let's go to Scripture. And I want to share with you, you've heard this story a thousand times, but I want to share with you how God, one man had an ear to hear God's warning. My question to you is, do you? Do you have an ear to hear God's warnings? All right. Let's go to Genesis chapter 7. And in Genesis chapter 7, we're just going to read a few of the verses just to lay a foundation of where God has taken this. Starting at verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, 
For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Now, this is one I, I want to say to you. Some of you may be the only ones in your whole family that has an ear to hear what God has to say. The warnings as pending judgments are coming down the pike. You may be the only ones that have an ear. My, my, what I want to remind you of is Noah was the only one in his family that had an ear to hear what God had to say. But because his family followed him, eight members all together got delivered from the judgment, from the destruction of all living things. And when you think about that, you may be the only saving grace for your whole family. Now, let me continue to read. Verse 4. For yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights. Every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Hmm. All right. Now, the end of this world, according to the Bible, is going to happen not through a flood, but through fire. So a lot of us are looking to see if Nibiru, Wormwood's going to end the world. We don't know how it's going to happen. If it's going to be through our own uh, nuclear nonsense, we don't know. But the bottom line is, whether God does it through our hands or by his hand alone, this world is going to burn. And it's not many days hence, as many of you think. Many of you think we got hundreds of years to go. Taint necessarily so. So what are you doing now? A lot of you think you got playtime. You're in recess. Nope. Recess is over, baby. Yes, God gave us the abundant life. Yes, we have benefits, promises, and all kind of stuff with God's love. Being in his kingdom. But that does not give us a license to deviate, to digress. Think about all the dirty deeds we're talking about. It does not give us the privilege of being so easily distracted, of having so much drama, drama, drama. No, we don't have time for drama. We don't have time for that. Some of us are extremely emotional. Any little upheaval, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh no, and all day long we're obsessed with this whole problem. No. No. Get your head in gear and stay focused. Things are getting ready to happen. You don't have time for you and your own nonsense, let alone anybody else's. All right. Now, let's go down because I just want to get to the point. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the, of the flood were upon the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the foundations of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Mm. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the son of Noah and the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind. And I'm going to stop there. So we know that they entered in and they were safe. Now, even though they were safe, it did not mean they were comfy, cozy, and all snuggled up like little bunnies. 
I'm sure the animal dung was getting the best of them. I'm sure the odors from the animals were starting to get really old. I'm sure that the that the quarters started to feel cramped and they were tired of being cooped up inside. Remember, they couldn't go out and take a walk. They couldn't jump on their bike and go bicycle riding. They couldn't go to the movies. Think about that. Think about that. Cooped up for how long? Oh my goodness. How many times did he send a bird out to come back to say, nope, there's no surface that's not covered with water yet. So this thing went on and on, just like this COVID thing, on and on and on, and they're cooped up. They're cooped up, but they must stay on task because they not only had to be prepared to live in that ark, they also had to be prepared for coming out of the ark. So they had to maintenance and take care of and feed the animals. They had to uh, take care of the plant life or whatever they had that they had put on that boat. They had to prepare. They had to get along, you guys. They had to be at peace with one another. And some people on this planet can't even stay at peace with each other just for being cooped up for a week or two, a month, a year, like some of you have been because of this COVID thing. This is not going to be the only thing that happens. There are other things coming. And some of them may be worse. Some of them may be more confining, may be more restraining, may be more annoying. And that's why we have to stay close to God. Because if we're not careful, we could be on the news as another statistic because we let everything get the best of us. When God, is the one that'll keep us in perfect peace if we keep our mind stayed on him, not on me, myself, and I, me, myself, and I, and the past. All right, now let's move on because we have to we have to overcome these dirty deeds. We're gonna go to Psalms chapter 27. This is some of what God encourages us with. When you're dealing with the dirty deeds, when you're dealing with the confinements of life, the um, the things in life where it seems like things are closing in on you, where it almost seems like you're getting backed up into a corner and you have nowhere to turn, nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide, and you don't know what to do. You're at your wit's end. Psalms 27. See, this is all the stuff we must deal with while trying to stay focused on that racetrack, while trying not to digress, be deviated, be disturbed, be distracted. We're trying to handle all of that ourselves and each other while we're trying to stay on the track. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. You notice it didn't say I stumbled and fell when they came to eat up my flesh. They stumbled and fell. So you don't have time. That's why you got to keep those frontlets on your eyes. Don't worry about what they're doing. Don't worry about what they're thinking. Don't worry about what they're saying. Keep the frontlets. Stay focused on your destiny. And you won't lose ground. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Jeanette, 
well, all tied up in knots because everybody's looking at her to make sure that they have enough patience so they don't lose their jobs. That's not Jeanette's responsibility. That's God's. They were looking to the wrong person. But thank God Jeanette knew who to look at. She focused on God. She focused on the race ahead of her. And what did God do? He came through because he's faithful. My heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me, and this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock and now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me therefore will i offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy i will sing yea i will sing praises unto the lord hear o lord when i cry with my voice this is what you do when things close in on you you cry out to god when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou said, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over to the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me and such as breathe out cruelty. I'd have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall. Not he might, he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Can you imagine Noah in the ark with his family, with all those stinky animals? What it must have been like waiting on the Lord to settle that boat down and say, okay, now I'll open the door and you can leave. Imagine how imprisoned they felt, how confined they felt. How bored they must have gotten. They were probably so tired, so sick and tired of being cooped up in that boat. And see, some of you, God is taking you through tight spaces. God is taking you through areas that are inconvenient. God is taking you, he's taking you through areas in your life. You don't understand it. You don't understand why it feels dark. Why everything seems to stink right now in your life. How bored they must have gotten. They were probably so tired, so sick and tired of being cooped up in that boat. And see, some of you, God is taking you through tight spaces. God is taking you through areas that are inconvenient. God is taking you, he's taking you through areas in your life. You don't understand it. You don't understand why it feels dark, why everything seems to stink right now in your life. You don't understand what God is doing. You think he's beating up on you. You think he's punishing you. You think he's angry with you. No, baby. So many of us, most of us, have to be developed by the fiery furnace of affliction. And that's how we get purified, like pure gold. And we come out on the other end, meat for the master's use. You have to be strong. You have to be fortified. And what God does is he deals with all your weaknesses, with all your imperfections, with all your cracks and crevices and the dirty deeds combined. He deals with all your flesh, all your pride, all your sinful ways because he knows that we are but dust. He knows what it'll take for us. 
God has to do what it takes to let life hone us, shape us. We must be honest to allow him to do what he wants to do, or we will miss out on the blessings he has. So we must work on our list of dirty deeds. We must work on ourselves. We cannot allow ourselves to faint. We must wait on the Lord and be of good courage because he will strengthen our heart. He's faithful that way. He will. He delights in healing us, y'all. He delights in putting us back together. As the song goes, the potter wants to put you back together again. And that's what you have to remember. God wants to put us back together again. Amen. So going through what's happening in these, in these last days, focus. Don't get distracted by the dirty deeds. Don't get pulled astray. Don't get hindered and delayed. Don't go through a long detour. What could have been a 13 days journey, you turn into a 40 year ordeal because you won't let go of your yourself. You won't let go of your flesh and your needs. Remember that. God bless you in these last days. God keep you. God cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Amen.